Hello and welcome to E233. I'm your instructor, Gregory Myers. In this video, we're going to take another look at our student course registration system. And specifically, we're going to take a look at the setup of our project using our static array data structure header file. So to begin with, you want to make sure and watch the introduction video that explains a little bit about the student course registration system and also sets up the switches as well as making sure that you have obtained a copy of the scrs.h file as well as the static array.h file. Now, to begin with, I want to point out that this is just one type of data structure that we can use with this project, and we're going to focus on this data structure or specifically arrays for this series of videos. So to begin with, what we want to do is we want to take a look at this core header file, the scrs.h, you'll notice that it has a lot of the basic functionality and structure, including the enumerators that we're going to use in this project. You'll also notice that we have a second header file that is the static array.h, and that is what is going to sort of lay on top of our base library or base header file uh, to provide them the structure in which we're going to store the data types that we have in the student course registration system. So for example, we have a student type or a student structure that has fields such as the student status, the ID, the first name, the middle initial, and the last name. But if you want to have multiple students, we then have to decide how do we want to store those students. This is where our static array is going to come in uh, a static array header file is going to come into play in that it is going to help us write the functions that allow for us to deal with multiple students, likewise for multiple courses and multiple registrations. Now keep in mind the idea here is that we want to allow then a student or students to be able to register for course or courses. And so ultimately we're going to have multiple students, multiple courses, and multiple registrations. So to begin with, like I said, we want to take a quick look at the structures for the student, the course, and the registration. And then what we want to do is go over and look at our static array.h and start to work on laying out some of the functions. You'll notice that in addition to the static array.h that I have placed under the header files, I've also created a static array.c file under my source files. And you'll notice that it already has some include statements in it, including a reference to the core.h, which you should have completed in an earlier set of videos, focusing on strings and file IO, as well as a reference to the base student course registration system header file, which once again contains the base structures that we're going to need. And then our static array.h that is going to deal with the arrays of students, arrays of courses, and arrays of registrations. So once you've added this static array.c, what we want to do is now work on the implementations of these functions. Before we get started, you also want to take a second to look at the constants that are relevant to the different arrays, particularly the student count, which will indicate the maximum number of students that our system can handle, the course count, which is the maximum number of courses that our system can handle, and the registration count, which will be the maximum number of registrations. Now, please note that we are going to be using static arrays. In other words, you're not going to be dynamically allocating memory for this particular demo, in which case we're going to be fixed on the number of elements in these arrays. Once you've completed this series, you'll probably want to go back and make some modifications to allow for a dynamic memory allocation or a different data structure in its entirety. But to begin with, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and copy over the function prototypes that are related to the student. I'll come back and do the ones for the courses and the registrations, and I'm going to also give you time later in the video to pause the video and complete the work and then follow up with me to see if you've done it right. So we'll go ahead and copy over these first set of function prototypes 
I'm going to keep the header files open, but I'm just going to go ahead and push them over to the side so that we can reference them later. And then what we want to do is break out these prototypes into function implementations by simply removing the semicolon and then adding a pair of curly braces. We'll come back and add the return values in just a little bit. For this video, I'm going to leave the examined student alone and I'll come back and visit this in another video. And so for right now, we're just going to focus on setting up our .c file that corresponds to the header file. All right, and then once you've done that, then what we want to do is take just a second to go ahead and add some basic comments at the top of each one of our functions. Once again, I'm simply going to go ahead and stub this in, and you can go back and complete this as you have time. So we're going to start off with the name, the description, and the args. And you once again simply want to make sure to make a copy of this in front of each one of your functions. And like I said, you need to go back once we pause the video and add the specifics for each one of your functions. Now, let's go back and talk about the return values for each one of our functions. To begin with, we want to look at the import students and we want to think about what is the most logical return value for the import students function. Now, normally we would do something like maybe exit success or exit failure or the count of the number of students that we have imported. But you'll notice for this particular function, in addition to accepting the file name and the students array, that we also have a by reference count variable. That means that we can update that value as the function runs or when the function runs. So essentially, we don't have to worry about the count as a return value. Instead, that integer return value to the left of the function name can in fact still be exit success or exit failure. This has a distinct advantage in that we can provide the caller of this function two pieces of information. The whether or not the function has ran successfully as well as the count of the number of items that have been imported. So what we'll do here for this one is we're going to have an integer results and we're just going to establish this as exit success. Once again, we're sort of using optimistic logic here. And then we will return our results. Now, moving on to the next function, that's going to be our display students plural. We may or may not need to do any significant error handling here. And you'll notice that we are also passing the count this time by value. So essentially we have no way of updating the count, nor would we likely need to update the count. So in this particular case, our integer return value is the only way for us to communicate back to the user, in which case then we can decide whether we want to have our results be the number of students displayed, or once again, exit success or exit failure. Since it's not likely we're gonna have much logic in this particular one, we're just going to leave this one as exit success for now, and we can discuss this later. For the sort students, we'll start off using the same approach, but this time around, I'd like for you to consider another option for the integer return value. And that would simply be the number of changes that needed to be made to the array as you were sorting the students. This would sort of give you a secondary feedback as to how disorganized your students array was. If you'll notice, we don't have any by reference 
count variables or something similar to that, we could consider adding that. But in this case, probably the most logical return value would simply be a count of the number of changes made to your array. This has the advantage of the, the calling function then can simply have an if statement that checks the return value for the sort students and then proceeds from there as to whether or not to possibly rewrite the output file. Continuing on, we have our export students, which once again, like our import students, has a couple of options here as far as the return value. But once again, notice that we have no by reference count. So in other words, we have no way to modify the count variable. And instead, we would probably want to consider exit success or exit failure as the most likely return value for the integer return of this function. However, you can also make a pretty strong argument that you may also want to simply return as an integer the number of characters written to the file or even the number of students written to the file. Once again, we're going to leave this one as exit success for now, and we may revisit this in a future video. Now for our add student. You'll notice that in this case, we do have a by reference variable. Our count is passed by address. So that means that we could increment the count should we have been successful in adding the student. This has some advantages because number one, we can provide both exit success and exit failure as the return value for the function but then you can also consider the scenario in which you didn't add a student because the student already existed in the array. The question is, does this count as a success or failure? And my argument would be that the function itself ran successfully. It just simply didn't add a student to the array because they already existed. In that same logic, then we could probably use an exit success or exit failure in our remove student. And the only time we actually decremented the count would be if we successfully removed a student from the array. Once again, if the student didn't exist, there wasn't a student to remove, then you could argue that that would be failure. However, you could also say that the function itself ran correctly. And so you would probably just have it return success and simply not change the count variable. The is a student now is going to be a little bit different. We are still going to have our integer results return value, but this time around, we want to map that essentially to a true or false. So in this case, is a student should return true or false depending on whether they found the student in the student's array based on the student ID. So at this point then, you would probably want to decide what your default value would be. In other words, would it be zero for false or and one for success or one for true rather, um, in which case then you once again can use this in the logic in the calling function. So our default in this case is simply going to be false. In other words, that the student with the student ID that we passed was not found in the student's array. The get student can use similar logic and that by default, we would just assume that the results were equal to zero or false, in which case then you can also leverage that in the logic for the calling function. If, for instance, this function returned false, there would be no need to check this student by reference variable for the updated student information. In our compare student, we want to use similar logic as we did in our string compare. If we recall from our string compare that essentially it looked at two strings, and if they were identical, depending on whether we were looking at it from case sensitive or insensitive perspective, then it would return zero. In other words, zero differences between the two strings. In this case, we would probably want to use a very similar approach in that it is going to return zero, which implies no difference between the two 
students. And at this point, then we will simply return the results. So in other words, if it returns zero, then we know that the first student matches the second student. We'll come back to this function a little later to take a look at what it actually means to compare two students. But for right now, we want to look at our copy student. And our copy student, once again, is going to rely on exit success and exit failure instead of a zero or one to indicate a um, true or false. In this case, we will probably have a little more significant logic that we want to look at, in which case exit success and exit failure would probably make the most sense. And then lastly, our display student. And our display student is likely not going to have a significant amount of logic in it, but we can just simply leave it at exit success or exit failure. In some cases, you will see certain developers and certain programs that will actually have a return value of an integer that indicates the number of characters that were displayed. Once again, this is not necessarily a bad idea. We're just going to keep it simple here. At this point, you want to go ahead and save it and just make sure that you have working code once again by building it. We actually aren't going to have a working executable yet. In other words, the executable compiles, but it doesn't really do anything other than what it did in the first video of triggering our if statement logic in our triaging of the command line arguments. But rather, what we want to do is make sure that periodically, as we're working on this project, that we don't introduce a typo and then miss it until we've added a significant amount of code. At this point, I would encourage you to go ahead and pause the video and go ahead and make the additions to each one of your comments section for each one of your functions, as well as going back and taking the same logic that we used to fill in or stub in these functions for the courses and for the registrations. And then what we'll do is in another video, we'll take a look at the bonus functions that focus on the registrations that uh, will return the rosters as well as the GPA and the transcript of the student. So for right now, what I want you to do is take a second to go ahead and set up your course and your registrations. And I will see you in just a few minutes. All right, welcome back. So hopefully at this point you have added in some information in your comments. You'll see here what I've done uh, is I've went through and just uh, put a brief description, um, apparently including a few typos in here, uh, for my student functions, um, including just function name, brief description of what the function does, as well as the arguments. Now what I've done here is I've actually identified each one of the arguments in the function signature, as well as the return value. Uh, to indicate uh, and to document a little bit about what the function does. Basically what we've already been talking about, just a little more detail. So you'll see that I've done this for the import students and the display students. I said, as, as I said earlier, I'm gonna come back to the examine students, but our sort students, remember, returns account of the moves in the array and the results as the result of sorting. Our export students, which writes to the file, our add student, which adds a student to the array, provided that the array has not grown too large, removes the student, which depending on how we view a removal, will either remove the student from the array or simply archive the student by setting its status to inactive. The is a student is going to return either a true or false. And then the get student, will also return true or false as well as updating the student by reference variable. The compare student, which will compare two students, and if there are any differences, then it will return a one, and if there are no differences, will return a zero. Our 
copy student, which will simply return success or failure, depending on whether it was able to copy from the source to the destination. And then lastly, the display student, which is simply going to display each one of the fields in a single student. It's going to be used in conjunction with our display students. What you want to do now is you want to go back to your static array.h and you want to go ahead and grab the course oriented functions as well as the registration oriented functions. And once again, we'll come back to those bonus functions in a later video. We're going to paste them into our project. And before we go too much further, we want to go ahead and expand each one of these out just like we did before from the function prototype into a function implementation. We also want to go through and insert the minimum amount of code to make the function viable. In other words, some sort of return statement um, based on the data type. And in this particular case, our data type for all of our functions is going to be int. Um, and once, some, once again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the video and we'll come back in just a few minutes once you've had a chance to get this done. Welcome back again. You'll see that I have set up my course functions, much the same way that I did with my student functions, and I have added the name, description, and arguments for each one of the course functions. Uh, the course functions are very, very similar to the student functions. The main difference is the structure is going to be different. In other words, the student type and the course type are going to be different. But if you come down here to the registrations, once again, also fairly similar. Uh, the big difference is that if you have an older version of the static array.h, there was actually a typo in there that we need to correct quickly. Um, and that is under our is a and get registrations. You'll notice in the original function signature, if you have an older version of the file, that it specified a registration ID. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use a course ID and a student ID as a composite ID in order to determine a unique student's registration. And to help understand why this is necessary, we can go back to the scrs.h file and you'll see that in the structure for the registration, basically the only information we really need to define a unique registration is the student ID and the course ID. And as such, both our is a function for the registration and the get registration functions will require the course ID and the student ID. Once again, just make sure to make that change both in your .c file as well as in your static array h. At this point, like I said, we'll cover the bonus functions in another video. You simply want to build your project to make sure that you don't have any significant errors. And at this point, then we'll move on to the individual functions. So once again, just to recap, what I've done is I've decided on my data structure being an array. I'm going to utilize my student course registration system, the base.h file, which holds the information about a student, a course, and a registration. In this case, a single one of each. In other words, a single student, a single course, and a single registration. And the static array.h helps define how we are going to handle multiple students, multiple courses, and multiple registrations. We need to include not only the scrs.h in the static array.h, but also the core.h. But as we'll discover as we go along, we may need to include other libraries. Hopefully you found this video useful. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns,
don't hesitate to email me and thank you for watching.